Hi, everybody, for our final roundtable. Um, this roundtable was not clearly defined at the time we were writing our program, and it kind of came out of some discussions that were happening during the conference. Um, but I really wanted to gather together a few voices on the stage to talk about the challenge of trying to learn in our community, um, trying to figure out like what resource to go to, who will support us, um, who helps, how we can help one another. Um, I'll, I'll introduce our, our panel in just a moment. I just wanted to give a bit of a, a background. Um, I, I was remembering like I first became, became aware of preservation when I was in eighth grade. I, saw an old movie from 1932 on television and it had splices in it and a lot of damage. There were parts of the, the film that were just cut out and it was taped together. So I would see the video would jump and then the audio would jump later. And I don't know, from, from so much of like watching television and media, I was never aware of the physical materials behind them. So I had no idea what an archivist was, um, but I was like, there must be somebody who is taking care of the physical objects. Uh, from this fascination, I tried to start finding more films, and then I quickly realized so much film is, is lost. Um, I remember going to the library and getting really into the, the cinema history section, which kind of presented the academia of, of cinema. Um, but it was extremely rare to find any resources about the care of cinema. Um, it just felt like I don't know who to talk to. Everyone is so far away from this. Um, at one point, I remember my grandmother sort of acting like, basically, I was saying I want to go to Hollywood and be a director, that it was like a na naive statement to say I want to be uh, working in preservation. Um, you know, so it was a difficult, st and like once I started to become aware of the programs, it's still such an intense decision when you're facing I don't know, such important things about using multiple years of your life or intentionally stepping deep into debt to, to make a decision on how you will actually learn how to contribute to this group. There's still many other ways to, to gather knowledge. There's you know, on-site experimentation. There's tons of professional organizations that will teach in a, in a week or in a summer. Um, there's uh, active mentor programs, conferences. And it can be difficult at the beginning to become aware of what, where these are. Um, I was also thinking of like once I started realizing I should try to find a mentor, um, I, I was talking to one person who was just kind of like spilling all their information and agenda upon me. And then when I was talking to somebody else in the field, they were like, oh, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. And I was just like, at these early steps, I'm already just stepping into such dirty waters when I'm trying to like navigate, and I just want to learn. I don't want to be in the middle of a personal debate between, between two people in our community. Um, so we're here to talk about the, the process, well, the, the challenge of trying to learn, um, to recount some stories, to give some advice, and to try to figure out how we can create environments that encourage learning in positive ways. Um, so I'm going to combine my first question with a request for the introduction of my panel. I just wanted to ask us one by one to introduce ourselves and just to share a little bit about your experience, both on the side of being the, the student or the mentee, and then on the other side being the educator, the teacher, the mentor, the encourager. Uh, start with Mary. So my name is Marion Yax. I work at the Austrian Mediathek. Um, I should have start with my journey since you told your journey. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm a historian actually, and I always wanted to be an archivist. I wanted to preserve things, but uh, the first thing was that I thought about documents. Um, then I ended up doing library study, and then I started at the Austrian Mediathek. Um, in a project where we set up our video digitization system. Um, like one thing that I remember is when uh, I applied at the Austrian Mediathek, I actually applied for a cataloging job because I was trained to do that. I'm a librarian. Um, and uh, when I received the call that I got the job, they said, well, would you actually like to take part in a video digitization project? And I said, are you sure? <laughs> Do you really mean me? I don't have any training in video. Um, 
the answer was, you will learn. And that's what I did. So I started off knowing, mm, being a consumer. Um, this is now going too long, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but th that's my story of, of me studying it. Um, and I want to hear of, of you as the student and you as the educator or trainer. Well, me as the student, I was very intimidated. That, that was me starting off, like feeling really insecure. And also being a person uh, trained uh, on the job. So this means you feel I go to conference, yes, I'm doing video digitization, but you feel very insecure yeah, about it. But we were a group of, of uh, people and we explored everything over a few years and um, kind of switched, switched um, the role of being mentor and mentee. Like I was doing the an analog digitization and I was exploring that side. Peter, who was part of the team, was coming with all his uh, programming and software experience. Um, and the third person was uh, Hermann Lewitz, uh, who came from uh, the film production background. And over time, with more experience, I knew more about analog video. So we kind of switched side at that. And one experience that I have now that I'm like, I've been at the Mediatek like since 13 years now, so it's been some time. Um, is that I feel it's it's always meeting people at conferences and there's those talks and chats in between, who are very helpful and are the least intimidating space uh, to talk about things. Uh, and one thing I also want to mention is that. For me, my whole journey in the video field was that I always used to be the one female person working with men. And on conferences, I always had the chance to meet some other female person who is doing similar things that I do. And I felt that always very encouraging. And now that I'm getting older, um, I experienced that uh, it's much more women who approached me, and I think it has something to do with that, that it's less intimidating. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Samaya Langley. I work at the Science Museum Group in the UK. It's the first museum I've ever worked in, but I've worked in, I guess, the glam sector, mostly in libraries and archives since early 2002, so it was <laughs> nearly 21 years. On and off, though. Um, my background was studying composition, electroacoustic composition, instrumental composition, um, and I was always going to study music because I was, well, at least I thought I was really terrible at maths and science and then arrived at, you know, first year music school and they said, here's this course on physics and psychoacoustics of sound, and then here's introduction <laughs> to programming in fourth. Um, so that kind of shows my age too. And all of this was beyond me. I'd grown up on an organic farm out in the country, didn't have a computer, couldn't work out how, how to turn a computer on. Uh, so I suspect that many of my undergrad experiences in the 90s, so this was in the mid 90s, were fairly negative and what I was watching with myself and others was that, I mean, it, the discussion then was really just a gendered discussion. There was no mention and, and possibly very little until recent years of any kind of intersectionality, but just watching that gendered involvement with music technology and, you know, to be a cliche, the young men in the room would w rush towards the instruments and press buttons on samplers and whatever. And the women would wait until everyone else had left and they could do that in private. And I think 
those kinds of experiences transfer over very well to the cultural sector and dealing with audiovisual stuff. Um, and so I guess I, I, it turns out that sound art doesn't pay rent, or at least it definitely didn't for me. And I needed a job, but I was working with a technology company, applied for a job at the National Library of Australia. And when they were hiring, they wanted to build a federated national federated resource into Australian music. So pulling together all the different disparate metadata and providing access to content through a singular source. And that, I mean, it really was 20 odd years ago. Um, but they didn't know who they needed to hire. So it's kind of an accident that I ended up there. What they needed was someone who knew about computers with a bit of interest in music. What they got was me, which was knowledge of music and mm, a little bit of interest in computing and a little bit of skill and knowledge. And so I don't have any formal experience in any of this. And it's definitely, and, and when I first walked into digital preservation in 2005, there was no education in this space in Australia. There was no AV training. The people who'd learnt audiovisual preservation had done some kind of traineeship through national broadcasters like the Australian Broadcasting Commission or, you know, the equivalent of the BBC in Australia. Um, so it was definitely learning on the job and I guess the most part of it was going home at night learning something and then coming back the next day because I had to teach someone else the thing that I'd never really actually learnt how to do and I could just kind of fake my way through it. And that hasn't changed 20 years later. So I guess as the mentor, I probably mentor people more across the arts and culture than I have really in collecting institutions. And I think some of the things that I've said, which have actually, it's been good to watch people <laughs> take that into account was actually don't do what I did, don't say yes to everything and don't burn yourself out to the point of collapse and because I did and, and it hasn't gone particularly well. So um, I don't know that I have many answers but just watching people take a moment and, and choosing what they could sink themselves into because we all do so much volunteer work and there's always another thing and another thing and we need it, but um, it's, it's <laughs> for a community that is all about long-term sustainability. Many of our jobs are not particularly sustainable, and so that needs to be built into kind of generational change. I think that's enough from me. Thanks. Um, so I'm Nick Krabenhoft. I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Preservation at the New York Public Library. Uh, I've also been teaching classes on digital preservation curation at the Pratt Institute for seven years, I think, and at um, the NYU MEAP program now for three years. Um, my journey into this space is uh, I, I was always, I, was, I, I don't know if always had access to a computer, but I had more access to a computer than I think a lot of other people, especially my age, uh, came up through the worlds of, you know, playing uh, video games over land parties, things like that, and uh, pirating anime, etc. That's where I first ran into MKV a long, long time ago. Came back into my life later. Um, but uh, life goes on. I try to get a degree in Islamic art history. Realize, boy, I'm not smart enough for that. I'm not. I'm not going to know the languages. I'm not going to know the art. I'm. I'm. I'm just interested. I'm. I'm an amateur. Uh, but I am the person in the room whenever I'm on a cultural heritage project that is most comfortable with computers, most comfortable with dealing with data. So I go to library school thinking I'm going to do computery stuff uh, with heritage, I guess, um, and uh, discover there the world of digital preservation, um, take every computery class that they offered at uh, the University of Michigan, and uh, then went onwards to my career. Um, all the while being a little bit confused as to what in the world was going on when I was learning all of those like computery classes um, at school because none of them seemed to really connect to each other. A bunch of you know, ideas about repositories or models or something and you're like, okay, so does everybody run every tool all the time on every single thing that comes through the thing? Like, is there some magical big workflow and we're here shepherding things through the, the assembly line? 
and then I get into the real world and it's like, no, that like this is not really what's happening. Um, and uh, I guess four or five years into working in the field, I get the opportunity to teach at Pratt. And I say, absolutely, I have to jump on that because uh, I, at that point in time, was somewhat, um, I wanted to see some change in how these types of things were taught. Um, I, I wanted to do it a little bit differently. So I was like, great, if you're going to pay me for it, this is a great marriage of interests. Um, so let's go ahead and try to do this. Um, and then that just exposed me to the fact that teaching is extremely hard. And uh, there, is, there is learning what you know about what you do, and then there's learning how to teach other people about what you do, which is a completely different set of skills and one that you know I constantly have to face my own uh, uh, not good enoughness at, um, my, my own uh, frailty in that space. But uh, yeah, I've been teaching for a little bit and hope to do a better job every year. Um, my name is David Pfluger. I'm here uh, representing Memoriaf, and I also work for Kinematek Lichtspiel in Bern. Um, I also work for a company who does audiovisual installations, and I, I also do this uh, on a freelance base. Um, I, I studied chemistry, made a PhD in chemistry, uh, and I never wanted this. So. <laughs> No, I kind of stumbled into this field um, when, when doing my PhD, I kind of realized I'd rather be an artist, uh, making movies, earning a lot of money, maybe, but didn't turn out that way. Um, I, I started doing uh, animated films on Super 8 because I kind of learned that from my dad. And... Um, I was mostly fascinated. I was also uh, a sh a project in movies at an off cinema, and then uh, my fascination for um, uh, for science fiction films led me to want to see the first science fiction film ever made. And uh, this, uh, I was told, is uh, Voyage dans la Lune by Méliès, and. This was around the end of the 90s, and I had a very hard time to find a copy. Not, I, I wouldn't even find one on, on VHS. And I ended up uh, buying one, an old uh, Blackhawk 16mm uh, print online. And uh, I remember watching this on my 16mm project. I had the equipment from my affiliation with uh, the... the of cinema, and this was kind of a total turning point for me, and maybe also a turning point for getting into film preservation, because that kind of comes with wanting to see old media. And from there, I, I kind of, uh, I, I then was lucky enough to get uh, a job at the post-production company in Zurich, working with video, digital, and film at the time. So this, on, on the technical side, um, I had no hurdles because I was coming from uh, natural science as a background. Um, but this was kind of an education for me, in, mostly in video, a bit in film, and, uh, because my interest was already on the film side and also in digital. And... Um, but but the, the connection then to preservation was kind of me just going to um, uh, conferences and festivals I'm interested in. But I would pay that myself, so there was a certain financial investment I had to make. I'm also a bit of a collector, so I started collecting books and stuff. And I think like, like many archives which or some archives are founded in collections and then need to professionalize over time. That also happened to me personally. So I was at first very much acting from my gut feeling that interests me. I want to do this. I want to have this. And then moving on to, okay, um, I need to, this needs to be more professional. And if, if I really want to establish my 
uh, also an, uh, get an income from that. And I have to say, today uh, I'm over 50 and still not earning all my money from, uh, from preservation, so it's kind of still a hobby. And um, so uh, I, I didn't have to challenge with the technical side, with, with um, that came relatively easily to me, uh, also through my interest, but I had the the challenge of the network side. So I had no network at all. Uh, but if you go to conferences long enough, people start to know you. You know, if, you, if you're good or not, if you know anything or not. No, but it, that was kind of the way. But it, it, there's an investment naturally in time and also not, not to um, ignore an investment in money. So I'm rarely ever sent by any employer or anybody to go to conferences. And finally, that's, uh, conferences are a place where you, where you make uh, connections. And naturally also, um, I'm, I said I'm also representing Memoria. I, I only punctually work for Memoria on an hourly basis, but I'm not employed there. Memoria is an association which is in principle a, a, a self-help group of uh, Swiss archives. Um, who, who at the point got together and, and said, okay, mostly mixed archives who do not know how to deal with photography, sound, video, and film. And they kind of got together and said, we, we have to make a Swiss-wide network where we educate each other. And I also mostly by accident um, could join one of these networks and that was also crucial for my personal further networks and my further education to be able then to pass on education to others uh, via this institution. And now I teach more on a, on a freelance base, but the fact that I've never been myself in an educational um, a program maybe helps me to understand what certain hurdles are and I always try to think back, okay, where was the point I understood something and why did I understood it then? And then I try to reproduce that in my own teaching uh, and uh, maybe not making this too long, but for me the hands-on aspect uh, is very important. So we always, it took me so long to have a reel of nitrate film in my hands. You know, and oh, it's dangerous and it's precious. We need materials, videotapes, and stuff which we can handle without any fear, which we can give out. Okay, take it apart, rip it apart, look what's inside, how does it feel? Because still, I, I think to me, preservation and the assessment of the, the condition of an element is very much goes through the senses, goes through smell, vinegar syndrome, etc. It goes through uh, how it feels in your hands. And younger generation, I'm still born in a world without digital media, but younger generations uh, don't have this experience, so we need to give them the media to handle free of fear to kind of uh, achieve the, the experience which the older people could have in, in their everyday life. So um, I don't know, as, as you said, David, I, I think there's such a, uh, a common thread of not asking for it and uh, for this, uh, you know, the professional opportunities we had, because often we're stepping into these opportunities that we currently have, the backgrounds in cataloging or chemistry or video anime, um, and having to go about discovering like what we need to learn. Um, so I don't know, I, I was thinking a lot about like once you have that opportunity and you want to take some sincere efforts towards being a good archivist, being good in our, position, uh, our positions. Like we, we know that there's a huge gap between what we know and what we need to know, um, but I find it's not just easy enough. It's not as easy as just being like, oh, well, if I just take this one class, it, like all the blanks will be filled. So, I mean, I'll, I'll let you answer in the order in which you might want to share, but I'm, I'm interested in the process of becoming, gaining clarity on what we're supposed to learn and how we're supposed to get that knowledge. Uh, for me, it was 
I really came from a practical experience. So it was, I did like digitization and then I came across some, some problems, some errors. So I, I always had this starting point from the practical side. And then um, it was like just two other areas like reading in books, reading about uh, video uh, technical stuff, but that's already taking the first step. So you first start off um, being able to understand that kind of language. And the other thing was talking to people. And um, that actually uh, needs a safe space. It, it reminds me of what, what you said initially, like asking people and you um, immediately get into some conflict or whatsoever. So it must be a space where you aren't judged for asking questions and for being insecure. I have some questions that I wrote just kind of contemplating each of you individually. Um, so I'll, I'll put this to one particular person, but others can feel free to jump in. Um, I wanted to start with Nick. Um, I assumed as a, a student of the program you were in, you considered it quite critically while you were there, and now you have a pretty, now you have a role as an educator in multiple institutions. So I was wondering if you could kind of compare the relationship between um, dealing with education on the student side to now being on the other side of the table and what you've, what you've brought across? Yeah, so I, I think as a student, I, I was really frustrated with what seemed like a lack of connection between things, as I said. It just, it, it was a scattershot. You do Droid one week, you do uh, J Jove the next week, there's Jove two, like there's just acronyms being thrown at you. You're not quite sure why, how, any of these things really stick together, um, and half your class is spent installing things and, and doing all that. So uh, when I got the opportunity to teach, I was like, oh great, like now, now I can you know, try and make those connections. I can try and build a framework in my class that says, okay, here's how all these things stick together, and also bring in some of that practical experience, which is uh, you have to choose which of these to use. You're not gonna use all these things. You, you will use some of them. You will go meet people who have no idea what some of these tools are because they're in a slightly different space and they think they understand what you do but really they use completely different tools and that's fine. Like, You need to figure out how to say, you know, you make images, I make video files. We do some of the same stuff but it turns out our tool set's completely different and, and we need to be able to discuss about it. So. Um, I've tried to create that in, in my classes, um, but the other thing that I'm still kind of struggling with is uh, I think, and this was only you know, 10, 15 years ago, you were kind of self-selecting to go into the digital sides in, in a library program a little bit ago, and, and nowadays it's just, you know, you should be comfortable with it on some level. You should, it's just part of our world that, that we're working with digital collections, and that means that there's a lot of people that have to take my class that honestly would prefer not to take my class, um, that, that would rather you know, just not have to deal with computers. And so trying to find, this goes in two directions, that trying to find a way to get them to feel comfortable in that class and to not exasperate any frustrations that they've had with computers over time, that's been uh, something that I've tried to focus on. I've also had to you know, look internally because there are some people that are just, you know, they're, they are gonna be in that class for 16 weeks and then they're gonna be gone and they're, they don't really wanna be there for 16 weeks and you kinda know it and, and there is a little bit of feedback from the student that's like, I don't wanna be here and you're like, I'm not gonna change your mind. Like that's, that, that, that's just something that's gonna be there. Um, but, but hopefully you, know, you can give them enough tastes of different things that they can get a sense when they're in a conversation of like, okay, I've heard about this and I can put it into a framework in which it makes sense, I, I hope so. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit strange because you um, trying to reach people that, that are like, I know I have to take this class but I'm not interested, it, it is a little bit harder to do as an educator. But hopefully, hopefully they're seeing the sense of like, well, I just wanna catalog things but I understand what that person in that other office is doing now so we can have a conversation at the very least. Maybe, maybe for teaching, uh, one thing there is um, you have to be, uh, you have to know 
who you're, who, the, the level of knowledge or where the people you come from, um, you teach come from. So um, it's very hard to, to kind of teach to a, a, a very incoherent group. Um, if you if you know more about um, ab about their backgrounds, you know roughly uh, the gap between your level of knowledge and their level of knowledge, and then it makes it easier to to kind of um, uh, uh, gear, um, make the presentation in a way that they will understand it basically. And I'm in a present. One thing is maybe important when you're teaching. Uh, teaching is not to show how much you know. Teaching is to uh, try to communicate information. So um, I think okay, there's a bit of a clash. The language should be according. So you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Uh, you were talking about terms. Um, you shouldn't deliver too, too many terms just, just to show off uh, that you know them. Um, on the other hand, there's naturally a clash. There's an interest to use a, a proper language. That's also part of the learning, that you learn to use language properly uh, in the field to be able to later communicate with your peers. Uh, so there's a little bit uh, a clash between using simple language and using the correct terms. So I think definition of terms and knowing what they mean is also an important part. And as I said, that you know uh, what you want to deliver and who are you talking to in that moment. Um, you remind me of something. One thing to to be very honest with your students about practical experience and. and Allow getting out of that theoretical framework, and if they have questions, say like, "This is what I'm facing at work." I think it grounds things much more directly than speaking from the paper or, or things like that. So that's another thing that I hope I'm bringing. Uh, so, in terms of that teaching experience, I guess more mine has been more about knowledge transfer. And thank you for that session earlier. Um, and I think the. Where I've had the opportunity to learn from someone else, it's been to shadow someone. So I don't have a background in paper archives. So I've definitely learned some archival principles through that process of going into the field uh, to do the digital collecting. But many of these collections coming into libraries and archives or special collections in libraries are hybrid. So there's definitely that opportunity to learn from someone who has that paper knowledge and they can learn from you. So some of that and teaching things like, the, I guess, the concepts and the principles rather than a particular tool. And when, when people do come to me and say, so I've done this course and now I know how to use whichever of the digital preservation systems, it's generally, you know, a preservation system, not really the underlying processes. And so the next system or tool throws them. I mean, Copter, the, the Copter tool grid has nearly 600 tools in there. You can't teach all of those in 16 weeks. So just knowing, I guess, concepts and principles and the ability to read error reports because it's, it's like looking at a sound desk. If you show someone a sound desk, there's a million buttons. If you teach someone how the signal flows through there, the, there's a process and you can find the problems. And, and I think that you know, that overwhelmedness that people feel about technology is not being given the tools themselves, that's probably not the right word, but to, to actually start to problem solve. I think we all do problem solving, but teaching someone how to problem solve and to look under the hood is, in my experience, not what people have at the moment, or we're losing that ability to look under the hood. All right, I wanted to... Uh, address the next question to Marianne. Um, for a lot of, I mean, some folks can can uh, delve into a two-year program and adjust adjust it so that education is their primary focus. But I think for a lot of us, most of the learning we are ever going to do is on the job. Um, so I'm I'm interested in this experience where they're like, oh, you're going to learn as you go, because I can imagine that be 
encompassing a lot of over promising and putting a lot more responsibility on the person to like pick up the pieces and learn than the supervisor. So I don't know, I was wondering what kind of, uh, what you have found to make that experience um, sustainable, manageable, part temporarily? Um, well, to be honest, since I uh, told you my, my start in video archiving, um, I think it, it didn't take long that I thought it was a very, very risky thing to employ me. <laughs> Because we, we did not have much video knowledge at the Mediathek at the time. It was mainly audio. Uh, it, it was audio and there was this video production team. So we really had to learn about what do we have in the archive? What formats do, uh, do we have? We needed to buy the recorders because we didn't have them. We have a, a huge collection um, of consumer formats uh, and a lot of variability. And our production team only knew D DigiBeta and Betacom SP because that's how they produced. So, um, like it didn't take long that I thought, okay, there's so much to learn. And the initial assumption was uh, basically that I would need to press some buttons like play and record. Uh, and that's actually not what it was. Um, and that put a lot of responsibility on me because I, I saw all this um, glitches and whatever, and I needed to know what, what are they, can I prevent them? Uh, what is um, like a histogram or <laughs> what can I do with that? And um, I needed to learn how to make uh, cables um, to get all the connections and to change our whole uh, video studio room to change the direction from uh, like having a DigiBeta and making a VHS copy to having uh, like all formats that we need and um, connect them to a computer. Um, yeah, the learning experience. It was on the way and I still um, perceive myself as someone learning because I think um, in, in my job and <laughs> I, maybe our jobs, <laughs> we are learning constantly because it changes so quickly um, now I feel like, yeah, very confident with um, the analog videos that I uh, experienced over the time I had. But since a few years, I'm now in digital archiving and that field is vast. And I think actually that's something that makes it very exciting and uh, is, um, yeah, a reason to do that job, to, to keep you learning. Right. Uh, so I have more questions prepared, but I certainly want to give a chance for the audience to answer, ask some questions. I would love to encourage voices of people who haven't participated. Oh, the list, the chat has. Okay, okay. I'll pass this to my stage coordinator. Hi, this is from our good friend Stephen McConaughey from the BFI, boosted by Sarah Gentile <laughs> that we just heard. So that's why. Um, this is a. This is a tough one, to be honest. Um, so here we go. So question for the panel. Our work is difficult to square with the net zero aims, where there really is no time to wait. Any practical thoughts on this challenge? OK, I'll start this off. So. At the Science Museum Group, uh, we have a sustainability strategy and plan. I think we don't have a policy or we have a policy, but on a plan. Um, and so by 2033, we need to be carbon net zero, including all supply chains. Uh, and as the digital preservation manager there, I know how much stuff we need to preserve and I don't actually know how to solve all of this. Within the UK, I think a lot of stuff is passed downstream to the next supplier and the, the sub-supplier beyond that. So I think there's 
that's definitely a risk of just kicking the tin can down the road or making it someone else's problem. Um, and I don't see that as a solution. I guess some of the simple things that uh, I think Liz and I were talking about the other night um, about working in community contexts where there is no budget for anything, so re reusing legacy equipment. And we have a lot of computers and things in our collection that perhaps uh, haven't, you know, we've collected more of some things than we need to. And so one of the basic ideas is that we may well hold a lot of non-working objects, but maybe we don't actually need them all. And so one of those things is to be able to, to reuse equipment for preservation purposes or to potentially pill for them for parts. Um, but that's a really simple thing. It just means someone doesn't have to come and drive to pick up a bunch of stuff and then take it away to be destroyed. But I think, you know, how... And I guess the other point is, yes, lots of those... If you're in the cloud storage space, lots of those suppliers are doing big calculations and will give you reports on that. But there are, there are a lot of problems too around noise pollution and impacting on lower socioeconomic communities when someone sticks a bunch of servers in a building somewhere. So um, I think the, the thing is we need to work together towards some of this and if people do have other bits and pieces. So those are, those are my tiny little things for now. All right, so I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I don't know, uh, push back on this because um, I think this is an important skill for any professional in this field is, is to determine when it's not your job and according to my organization it's not my job right now um, and honestly I can be concerned I can think about good ideas but we have a lot of other problems we need to be more accessible we need to uh, think about how we deliver access in a faster way we need to do all these things and until my organization says you know this is on the priority list I'm giving myself stress for something that I'm not going to be able to affect change in. And so that's that's kind of, you know, I it's my job to remain, you know, interested and uh, think, you know, listen at conferences and to understand what's going on and to be ready for an opportunity to discuss things. But, but yeah, I can't be an expert in all things. And until somebody kind of offers some benefit to me to be an expert in that thing, I, I just, you know, I, you, you have to limit yourself in some way. Any other questions? Uh, just to say there's a little lag, so it'd be interesting to see if there's a feedback from Stephen, but I can just give it to you privately. That sounds a little rough, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Um, there's certainly... A lot of other questions I'd want to ask this group, um, but I, we have to move on to our last word soon, so I just want to uh, pass the mic around and ask for some final comments. Um, whatever you'd like to share, but I'm particularly interested in, in what you found helps facilitate a effective, positive uh, learning environment. I'll start with you. I think as there are still uh, not enough opportunities of uh, educational programs for, for this whole field, I think one important thing everybody can do is some kindness to newcomers. I don't see a lack here, but if, if I look back, I've, I've rarely been kind of actively refused. But maybe the, the, the worst thing that happened to me is being ignored, maybe. <laughs> but. Um, I think, I think even if you have to explain something for the hundredth time or another student comes, maybe show a little kindness and explain it still or give advice on where to go to look that up or to go to another person. I think that, that's already a, a big deal. Um, I'm going to say keep in mind that everybody's wrong, um, <laughs> including yourself. Um, you might be right on some things, but you're wrong on a lot of things, um, as is everybody else that you're talking to. And so be willing to, you know, look at some of your heroes and say, oh, okay, yeah, they're wrong. Um, that's, that's fine. Um, but then also go through the process of trying to, 
you know, figure out, well, why are they wrong? Is this just a gut reaction or, you know, is there, is there a deeper reason as to why I disagree with them from, you know, a technical point of view, a ethical point of view, there, there's lots of points of view, but um, everybody's gonna have different points of view and, you know, you, you gotta balance it through there and find out what really makes sense in your context. I'm not going to say anything new apart from what you two both said that that I ended up doing some of this, particularly the the more technical side of things, was to prove people wrong because they thought I couldn't do it. And while that might have been a good motivator for me, I don't think that that should be the default motivator. I think that care, you have no idea what's going on in someone else's life, whether it's a student or, you know, the people sitting next to me that, you know, I, there are lots of big things that are probably coming down the line that we've got no idea of and and just that, that care and allowing people the space and, and finding ways, like this is hugely privileged for me to be here and I've paid my way to a lot of conferences and I'm not this time, I'm paying my way home, but the, you know, that there are so many people that are never going to be able to get on that plane and and find a way of being there. So making sure that those conversations are out there. And yes, there's no one right answer. So that, you know, yes, we're all wrong and things change. And yeah, that's enough. <laughs> um, so what I... Uh really find helpful is having the approach of I, I don't tell you how you should do it but I can tell you how I do it and another point is that often it's it's not this one recipe because we work in an environment we have different circumstances different different means and uh, it I think it takes a lot of uh, creativity to find the, the best way to do your job and that uh, means discussions, yeah, in a good place. Wonderful. Well, I don't know. I really want to thank our panel. Let's please have some applause for them. <laughs>